Hi, my name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be covering the case of Chad Daybell, in which he is currently on trial for the conspiracy to kill his wife, Tammy Daybell, and the two children of his new wife, Lori Vallow Daybell. Those children's names are JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan. An attorney that is not associated with his case filed a motion to intervene because Daybell's attorney is not a death penalty qualified attorney in the state of Idaho. Idaho allows for non-death penalty qualified attorneys to take death penalty cases. Because Chad Daybell is facing a charge of three murders, he is facing the death penalty. Now, Judge Boyce, who is the judge overseeing both the trial of Chad Daybell and who oversaw the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell, for which she was convicted of those crimes and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, set in a hearing to consider this motion to intervene. So we're going to look at Judge Boyce's reaction to the motion to intervene, as well as the motion to intervene itself. All right. Good afternoon. We're on the record on case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. Mr. Daybell is here present, represented by his attorney, Mr. Pryor. The state's here present, not currently seated at the prosecutor's table. Seated there is attorney Terry S. Ratliff, along with a, uh, another attorney, Mr. Bartlett, who represents Mr. Ratliff, the court is taking up today an order to show cause hearing, and I'm going to briefly discuss the procedural history that brings us to this at this time. I'll note that this was a motion that was filed by Mr. Ratliff, who is a bar licensed attorney through the state of Idaho, and filed a pleading purporting to be the attorney for the defendant in this case. And the pleading was filed on March 29th at 1142 PM. So shortly before midnight on a Friday. And I do want to discuss briefly the timing of the filing. The court was conducting jury questionnaires and preparing for jury voir dire in this case, which of course, is a capital murder case, an incredibly serious case where the court counsel has spent a tremendous amount of time preparing for and getting ready for trial where we are now. The court uh, was not made aware of the filing because it was not entered in the case until Sunday morning on March 29th, the day, I'm sorry, that would have been on March 31st. That was Easter Sunday before we were going to start with our voir dire the following Monday. Voir dire is jury selection. On Easter Sunday, my staff attorney who had an opportunity finally to travel home and spend Easter with her family after a very long week uh, was interrupted out of her church services and contacted the court that we had an emergency happening in our case that was going. And the emergency was we had a motion to continue the trial. And I wasn't sure who was asking to have the trial continued, why the trial would be continued, but this created a tremendous amount of quick response required by the court. It is important to note that a case of this magnitude, it has been uh, percolating for five years at this point in time, because I think that these events really started to pop off in 2019 and 2020. Um, a case of this magnitude takes a lot of preparation to get to the trial date. It is expensive. It's time consuming. And so to go through the voir dire process, voir dire is what this judge says. It's a regional thing. Everybody says it differently. I say voir dire. So to go through the voir dire process and then on the eve of the commencement of the trial to have someone file a motion to continue that trial would cause everyone to freak out, Right. Because especially if you're not quite sure where this is coming from, whether or not the grounds are sound, every judge has to look at the motions that are filed and see whether or not there is a valid basis for this motion that the court can actually act upon. And so until we fully understand what this attorney was really asking for, it is important to note that most attorneys would be very, very 
cognizant about asking for a continuance of a trial that you've already started the voir dire process in of picking your jury because most judges are never going to grant that. It has to be something very extraordinary to continue a case when you know that you've already picked your jury, right? You have inconvenienced all of these people that have come in to sit through the voir dire process, all of the civilians that are coming in to potentially serve on the jury. You've put those people on the jury. And so then to try and continue it at the very last minute is something that is rarely done unless there's something serious like someone passed away in your family or something. So that's why the urgency with which this is addressed is coming through and why this judge who's pretty even keeled throughout the entirety of him dealing with this case seems to be upset. By staff, by clerks, by the prosecutors, by the defense, uh, all occurring again on one of the few days we had a break as we were grinding through jury selection on Easter Sunday. The pleading the court received is entitled motion to intervene and to continue the trial in these proceedings filed by Mr. Ratliff on his official office pleading letterhead signed by Mr. Ratliff as the attorney for the defendant, both on the signature line and on the caption. I'll note the. Several things are improper here. Number one, he is not the attorney for Chad Daybell, so he's filing this motion, Mr. Radcliffe. So you see Chad Daybell sitting there to the left um, uh, in the box to the left. He is to the right of his attorney, John Pryor. John Pryor is Chad Daybell's attorney. And so Mr. Radcliffe is filing a motion to continue Daybell's case, right? And signing as though he is the attorney for Daybell when he is not. This is improper. Pleading incorrectly spells the word motion. It incorrectly spells the word continue. It incorrectly spells the word proceedings in its caption. And when I reviewed this. I just want to stop you guys there. Now, we attorneys, we're not perfect. Sometimes we'll have a typo or two in a motion, right? For the judge to point out, first of all, it's a lot of typos for just the caption alone. So that's just the header part of the motion. You've already got all these typos. That's already concerning. <laughs> but for the judge to point it out on the record for everyone to hear, he knows the effect of his words. And this is to serve as a form of embarrassment, which I think Mr. Radcliffe should be embarrassed because this is a motion that he should not have filed um, and is completely inappropriate. And this is the judge showing his ire, although this is a pretty mild mannered judge, um, by saying, You filed something inappropriate and unethical, and you couldn't even spell it right. I'm going to tell you, Mr. Ratliff, I was angry then, and I think I'm angry Ratliff. now about what you did. However, in light of allowing you some due process, I looked through a correct way to handle this, and I considered Rule 11. I'll note you've retained an attorney, Mr. Bartliff, I'm sorry, Bartlett, and I have reviewed a lengthy response brief along with declarations submitted on your behalf. And procedurally, where we are, first of all. So that it's clear the attorney who filed the improper motion to intervene because on behalf of Chad Daybell, apparently without Chad Daybell's consent, and without his lawyer's consent, because he takes issue with Chad Daybell's attorney not being death penalty qualified. Um, the fact that he has filed that, the judge responded with basically, we need the show cause hearing. And when they say show cause, every attorney knows that that means show cause for why I should not hold you in contempt of court. And by holding you in contempt, the court can issue several sanctions, up to and including jail time. Yes, attorneys for improper conduct in court can be placed in jail, right? That's how serious it is and why you have to be very, very careful with the things that you file and do in court. And so when an attorney is facing a show cause, they will often seek out counsel themselves to represent them. That's how you know that if you are facing a judge and you're charged with something, 
it is always a good idea to get an attorney because attorneys will get attorneys, especially if we are potentially going to be disciplined. So I wanted to be clear, Mr. Radcliffe filed this motion and the judge said, this motion is improper. I want you to appear in court before me for a hearing to show cause as to why I should not hold you in contempt. And that attorney hired his own attorney to represent him. And the attorney who represents him filed some motions to basically explain his client's behavior. The order to show cause for me is for you to explain, Mr. Ratliff, to personally explain to me how your pleading complies with Rule 11 of the Rules of Civil Procedure. Typically, when someone shows up with an attorney, their attorney gets to argue for them. However, under certain circumstances, I don't know that the right to counsel attaches, and in particular, under a Rule 11 request, I don't believe it does. I'll note the Rule 11 is a rule of civil procedure, which typically would not apply in a criminal filing. However, there are rules under the criminal rules that states we do follow civil rules when there's no corresponding rule. And in particular, criminal rules 47 and 49 indicate that filings of motions in criminal cases are to be filed in the same way and manner, and using the word manner in which pleadings have to be filed in civil cases. Let's take some time to explain that. Idaho rule of civil procedure number 11 is about how motions should be filed in court. And through an additional rule, the rules of civil procedure are incorporated into the rules of criminal procedure, which this is a criminal case. So civil cases is where money or property are at stake. Criminal cases is where your freedom is at stake. So you take the civil rules of filing motions in court and pleadings in court, and you apply them to the criminal rules in the state of Idaho. So Idaho rule of civil procedure, rule 11, signing pleadings, motions, and other papers, representations to the court and sanctions. Signature, every pleading, written motion, and other paper must be signed by at least one attorney of record licensed in the state of Idaho in the individual attorney's name or by a party personally if the party is unrepresented. So the attorney of record means the attorney who has been retained by the defendant to represent them and they have entered their appearance in the case and they are the attorney of record. So let me give it to you like this. Say that I represent John Doe. I file my appearance in the case. I am the attorney of record. However, my coworker is, you know, my coworker, they're my friend, whatever the case may be. And they don't like something I do in the case and they go to file into the case. They are not the attorney of record. So for them to file into the case without some type of legal justification for them to be able to do so would be violating rule 11 under the rules of civil procedure because you must be the attorney that's entered into the case. Reading on for further, the paper must state the signer's address, email address, and telephone number. Unless a rule or statute specifically states otherwise, a pleading need not be verified or accompanied by an affidavit. The court must strike an unsigned paper unless the omission is promptly corrected after being called to the attorney's attention. So if you are not the attorney of record, then the filing must be stricken from the record. By presenting to the court a pleading, written motion, or other paper, whether by signing, filing, or submitting, or later advocating it, an attorney or unrepresented party, that's a pro se person, certifies that to the best of their knowledge, the information is basically true. There are sanctions for not following Rule 11. If after notice and a reasonable opportunity to respond, which is this reasonable opportunity to respond, the court determines that Rule 11 has been violated, the court must impose an appropriate sanction on any attorney, law firm, or party that violated the rule, violated the rule or was responsible for the violation. 
A law firm may be held jointly responsible for a violation committed by its partner, associate, or employees. So under Rule 11B, you have to make representations that you know are true, right? Or that you believe are true. Um, But you also cannot make a filing for an improper purpose to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. So you cannot harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. What is happening here in court? Every day that you're in court, that increases the cost of litigation. We don't think about that in criminal cases, but usually when defendants are convicted and they receive a suspended jail sentence, meaning some in jail and some on probation, they usually have to pay court costs because it costs money to have the court reporter in there, to have the bailiff, to have the um, police officers or sheriff's deputies that control the courtroom, to pay everyone's salary. Everybody that has to be in court, they are not able to do anything else but be in court. So it costs money and time to have an actual court proceeding. <clears throat> court proceeding. And so by having this motion, he is wasting time from what they should be dealing with in the trial. Rule 11 governs licensed attorneys and the representations they make. There's been some indication of your counsel that perhaps Rule 11 doesn't apply I believe rule 11 does apply. I don't believe lawyers can file whatever they want in a criminal case without being subject to the representations under rule 11, where they certify certain things and making those filings as officers of the court. And what they're certifying is that they're the attorney of record, that what they say to the best of their knowledge is true and that they're not filing this solely to waste the court's time or increase cost or to delay the case unnecessarily. To argue otherwise would say any lawyer could file anything they want in a criminal case and not be subject to any kind of sanction under Rule 11. That's not true. And I believe Rule 11 permits exactly that for me to consider it. Rule 11 under Part C3 allows the court to conduct an inquiry on its own initiative and the court has done this not at the request of the parties but at my own request because i do have questions for mr ratliff so in determining whether or not to impose sanctions under rule 11 c3 on the court's initiative on its own the court may order an attorney law firm or party to show cause why conduct specifically described in the order has not violated rule 11b And I'll note procedurally, while I appreciate uh, the time and research Mr. Bartlett has put into the case, we don't have a party in this case appearing before me. Uh, Mr. Ratliff, you are not the defendant. You are not the state. You are not a prosecutor. You are not the defense attorney. You are an attorney with a license that filed something asking me to stop this trial when I don't think You had any legal standing to do that. And I'm going to give you personally an opportunity to make any explanation you want as to some of my questions. Uh, I am not going to turn this into an adjunct litigation under the auspices of this capital murder case because quite frankly, you don't represent the defendant here. You don't represent the state. You're not a party. And I'm not gonna let this devolve into a whole separate procedural mess in this case and create a record of some side issue that has nothing to do with the charges the state is currently putting evidence on for. So So the thing to think about here is that what the judge is saying is, if I were to entertain your motion seriously on the merits of what you're asking for, which is to intervene as the attorney for Chad Daybell, who did not hire you, right? Because you have an issue with John Pryor not being death penalty qualified and going through the qualifications of John Pryor versus the qualifications of Ratliff, that would cause an unnecessary delay in this trial. And let me be clear here. This is a serious case. This is not a case for somebody to try and make a name for themselves or get famous or even 
flaunt their prowess to the court, right? I don't really know what this man's intentions were, but this is not the case for that. And here's why this is not the case for that. This is a triple homicide case. Two of the victims are children. The case has been pending since 2019, 2020. There is a right to a speedy trial, which, you know, Daybell gave up a bit, but not totally. He's going to want to have his trial in a reasonable amount of time. They want to see a resolution to this case, not only for Daybell, but also for the victims, for the family members of the children and Tammy Daybell that want to see a resolution to this case. So it is not appropriate for him to try and intervene in order to, for the sole purpose of delaying the case, right? And causing unnecessary expense. So let's hear from him. What is his reasoning before you even get to the motion? What is your reasoning for even filing the motion? Now that I've had my say about how we got here and why we are here, Mr. Ratliff, I have questions for you under Rule 11. And if you'd like to answer those questions personally, I will ask you some questions. If you don't want to answer those questions under the advice of counsel, I'll understand that as well. And I don't know that I even need any input from the parties. So he has a right, um, you know, under the show cause. It's not a criminal proceeding necessarily, but he still, like everyone, has a right to remain silent and he has hired counsel. So the judge is saying, I want to hear from you directly, but you don't have to do that. I don't really want to hear from your lawyer, uh, but you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. And I'm pretty much sure how I'm going to go. So what he's saying is, I'm going to sanction you anyway, but I'll give you the chance to try and talk yourself out of it if you want to take that chance. It could go one of two two ways. He could either say something that turns the judge's mind around like, oh, no, this was a real concern that you had. And let's address the issue that you raised. Or he could say something that makes the judge think, nope, I was right. This is a waste of time and an unethical filing. So, Mr. Ratliff, are you going to answer the court's questions as it relates to Rule 11? Oh, was that inconvenient for you? Was was that, I'm asking you a direct question, was that inconvenient for you? Mr. Bartlett, hold on. I, I indicated I wasn't gonna have you argue this motion. I allowed you to start making it and you are doing precisely that. I've thought this through. I'm in rule 11 here. I'm in a rule that governs lawyers and their pleadings. When lawyers sign off on pleadings, lawyers are responsible for their pleadings. Lawyers, unless they're facing a sanction of jail under contempt, do not necessarily have the opportunity to have counsel represent them on a Rule 11. If you file a frivolous civil complaint and a judge says, I'm going to award fees because it was frivolous, you don't get to have another lawyer from another firm jump in between you and the judge in the complaint you filed because you have the responsibility as a licensed attorney to put your name on pleadings and stand behind your signature under those rules, under Rule 11 and what you certify, and you answer those. In my opinion, and I'm the judge here, this is how you address Rule 11. So with all due respect, Mr. Bartliff, I appreciate you attempting to and wanting to represent your client. Again, you can do that. You've talked to him before. You can talk to him after. But the questions I have on Rule 11 relate directly to a pleading that Mr. Ratliff filed as licensed attorney in this case. And I have a right to ask him about his pleading that he filed. And so if you want to take a moment to consult with him, you can do that, but I'm not gonna have you argue the merits of this. That will be up to you or Mr. Ratliff. That's that I have an opportunity to speak with him. So thank you so much for that. Okay, I'll uh, give, take the time you need. I don't wanna spend much more time this afternoon. We're in the middle of this trial. We've had evidence today. We're gonna to have evidence tomorrow. Make it quick and then let me know what your client wants to do. Yes, sure. All right, Mr. Ratliff, I have some questions about your pleading. Are you willing to answer those? Sure am. So it was indecipherable what the attorney for Ratliff was saying, but essentially it sounds like he was trying to still go back to the merits of the motion to intervene, 
which the court has made very clear that they have no interest in. What they want to know is what was the reasoning behind, you know, filing the motion itself and whether or not his reasoning included these impermissible reasons such as waste of time and delay and to make misrepresentations to the court. Like it's an essential misrepresentation that Ratliff signed his name as Daybell's attorney when he is not Daybell's attorney. And so the judge basically shut down Ratliff's attorney um, trying to argue the merits, the actual issue of prior being uh, death penalty qualified and said that he needs to consult with Ratliff and he will give them the chance to come back and explain Ratliff's position. All right, the pleading I'm looking at, it's not been entered in the case yet, and the pleading, give me just a second. All right, you did in fact file this electronically in CR, uh, well, that's wrong to the case number, but this is case CR 22-21-16-23, the state of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell, is that correct? That's correct. All right, I'll note the uh, case number's wrong as well. You've got it, CR 1221. Uh, the first part I want to know under Rule 11, which requires you to make representations to the court, you hold yourself out as entitle yourself attorney for the defendant. Why do you say that? Judge? This is the first big mistake that Ratliff makes in this file. I mean, filing it at all is a big mistake. The typos are a big mistake. But the the big mistake here is you're holding your, you have no basis to file into this case. You don't represent either party, prosecution or defense. You don't even represent a witness in the case. And so you have no real way to file into it. So you're filing as though you're Daybell's attorney, which is a lie. You were not Daybell's attorney. So let's hear what his reasoning is for that. As you know, this is a template form and I simply forgot to take that off of there. That was Scrivener's error on my behalf. Okay, Scrivener's error. So he said that he just used a template and he accidentally put his name as Daybell's attorney. I don't want to disparage this guy any further than it's already gone, but um, I'm incredulous because, you know, despite the typos and everything, there is an essential issue with filing on behalf of Daybell when you don't represent him that I think shows that you're not being completely honest here but let's see so he's saying he's saying you know basically Scribner's error I made a mistake on the if you, if you notice in the body of the the motion judge I say without permission of the defendant or his trial counsel so then maybe you should not have done it he filed this motion without the permission of Chad Daybell or his own attorney. And it, this is a high profile case. You have to wonder how much of this is just someone not really caring about the quality of the system and the quality of representation and more interested in getting their name out there. All right, let's look at your signature on page three. You signed Terry S. Ratliff of the firm attorney for the defendant on page three, don't you? Again, because it was in my template. That. It, it's just it's done multiple times where he signs himself as attorney for the defendant because I'm sure he signed it on the bottom of the motion itself and on the certificate of service and template or not you're supposed to proofread which clearly he didn't hear so you know you guys tell me what you think do you think that he was being you know innocent guy who was just uh you know just trying to be helpful and forgot to change the name from attorney for defendant to I don't know, intervener or something like that? Or do you think that he was um, holding himself out as Daybell's attorney somehow or being dishonest to the court? All right, on page two, again, a signature. Third time. Terry S. Ratliff of the firm, attorney for the defendant, correct? I don't have page three, Joe. I just have a page one and two. The bottom of the certificate of service is one signature, another at the bottom of the contents of the pleading. Mm -hmm. If it's there, Judge, it's there because it's a template form and I didn't strike it. 
Okay. So three times you called yourself the attorney for the defendant. Um, so three times doesn't seem like an accident. Who are you the attorney for? Me. So Terry S. Ratliff, attorney for Terry S. Ratliff in this case. I should have signed citizen. Citizen? Yes. What? No. This is a criminal procedure. This is a criminal case proceeding, criminal proceeding, right? At the trial level. It's not like it's on the appellate level and sometimes people call, file what's called amicus briefs. I'm an attorney and as a friend of the court, this is how I think the court should rule, right? And usually sometimes they're like interested because they're a part of some organization that would be impacted by the ruling or their, you know, victim family members or something like that. You have absolutely nothing to do with this trial case. This is not an appeal. This is a trial case. Other attorneys who are not involved in the case do not file pleadings in that case, okay? That is inappropriate. Sometimes attorneys who don't represent the prosecution or the defense can file because they represent an interested party like a victim or a witness or the state or the defense are seeking records from a hospital or social services or you know, work records and the attorneys for those different companies will file something saying, in this case, you requested records from me and I either do or do not want to give the records and here's why, right? So they're representing a party who's interested in the case. He's representing no one. So he's saying as a civilian or a citizen, citizens do not file motions into criminal trial cases. You just don't interfere in them. You let the attorneys who are dealing with the party parties handle the filings right this is completely inappropriate and as a licensed practicing attorney he should know better why are you referencing your bar number if you're just citizen bar number in many states attorneys have to include their bar number in order to uh, file their motion. And that's just to ensure that this person that's filing this motion is actually an attorney, right? And it's all, it all goes against him saying, I'm just filing as a concerned citizen because he uh, included his bar number, which holds him out as an attorney, not just a concerned citizen. Again, it's the form, Judge. It's, it's a reference to the form. I'm not Mr. Daybell's attorney, never was. You, have filed it. you put this on a pleading. If you look at the top left, you've got your name, your Idaho State Bar number, your Ratliff Law Offices, and attorney for defendant. You're telling me you mistakenly just wanted to file something as a citizen and not as a lawyer? I was looking for immediate relief because of the Kearns concerns I had about the case, Your Honor. And why were you doing that on? On a Friday night at almost midnight, what because you've known about this case for a long time, according to your own content here, right? That's correct. So why are you doing it then? Let's pay attention to this, because what are some of the prohibitions on filings? You cannot file to waste time, to waste money and cause unnecessary delay. Right. And it seems to be quite strategic that he files it right when the trial is starting because he's known about this trial for a long time. And it's always been known that John Pryor, who I think is, I've told you guys this before, I think John Pryor is doing a very good job in the case. I know a lot of people don't agree with me. I think he's doing a great job, right? But John Pryor, who's doing a good job but is not death penalty qualified, is representing Chad Daybell. That's been known for years. Why didn't you file something before? Before it would cause this unnecessary delay in the commencement of the trial. Because I thought I needed to do something to slow it down. What did he say? What is he? Why did he file this late? Night at almost midnight. What because you've known about this case for a long time, according to your own content here, right? That's correct. So why are you doing it then? Because I thought I needed to do something to slow it down. Because I thought I needed to do something to slow it down. Let's go back to the law. Idaho Rule of Civil Procedure 11C, excuse me, no, 11B. 
Uh, um, the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are must be warranted by existing law or by non-frivolous arguments for extending, modifying, or reversing ex existing law. It is not being presented for any improper purpose, such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. What did he just say? He wanted to cause a delay. Trial scheduled for how many years and you wanted to slow it down the day before trial started? I'd also gotten calls from Mr. Pryor, Judge, for help. So? That might be fine, but did he ever retain you on the case or did you ever enter an appearance for the defendant? I did not. So Mr. Pryor reaches out to Mr. Ratliff, Ratcliffe for, you know, assistance or maybe guidance or maybe ask some questions of him. And he says, ah, this concerns me so much. I want to intervene in the case. There are several things that you can do if you're an attorney and you are concerned that the attorney who's representing somebody is not equipped to handle the case, especially a very serious case. Number one, you can talk to that attorney. You could offer your assistance pro bono, but if you want to make it more formal, you can contact bar counsel, who is usually whatever governing body oversees, you know, licensure. You don't even have to file a complaint. You can just ask them for guidance. What do you think I should do? You can write a letter to the court and serve it on all of the parties, not asking the court to take any particular action, but maybe express that you're concerned. The judge can conduct his own proceeding to see whether or not this attorney is qualified to take this case. So there is an actual procedure for that to question an attorney about the due diligence they've done in the case. They do not require for every attorney who takes on a case to have a certain level of qualifications. Instead, they require that you be diligent in your representation of your client, that you visit them, that you show them the discovery, that you seek out experts, that you research, that you show up on time for court, that you're doing the work of advocating for this person. But if someone consults with you as the more experienced attorney or the more qualified attorney or whatever the case may be, it is not good form to then file a motion to delay the trial so that you can intervene. So for those of you that may have concerns, maybe prior isn't ready for crime time, prime, crime time, prime time. Maybe prior is not ready for a case of this magnitude, which I don't think is the case at all, but that's just my personal opinion. Maybe you think that. Please know that there are other avenues that are extremely effective to ensure that Daybell receives a fair trial. This goes against making sure that Daybell receives a fair trial because you're unnecessarily delaying his trial. Trial scheduled for how many years and you wanted to slow it down the day before trial started? I'd also gotten calls from Mr. Pryor, Judge, for help. That might be fine, but did he ever retain you on the case or did you ever enter an appearance for the defendant? I did not. All right, and you do state in here you're filing this pleading without the permission of the defendant or his counsel, correct? That's correct. You also state in here and call yourself an intervener. What basis do you have Whatever to intervene? Is. Based on my, I didn't want to run the brief. Yeah. It's, it's set out in our brief, Judge, as to the basis for why I wanted to intervene. Hmm. I, in the motion, I quote you the relief I wanted. I give you the grounds on page one as to why I wanted that relief. Okay, well then state them. Don't be a smart aleck right now. The judge is very mad at you. And why I thought it was necessary. Okay, and you're going to intervene now not as Terry Ratliff lawyer, Terry Ratliff citizen at large? I think it's semantics, Your Honor. Oh, boy. <gasps> Let me stop you there. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. It is not. It is not semantics. And let me say why it's not semantics. It is not semantics because you are filing something as an officer of the court that you are, by putting your signature to it, certifying that it is true, that it has multiple misstatements, multiple misspellings. And the reason that you filed it, you stated was for an improper purpose. You came out and you said, I filed this for a bad reason, right? So to say, 
whether or not you're trying to proceed as a citizen or as an attorney for Daybell is semantics is foolishness because the only way you could proceed in this case is as an attorney to Daybell. But Daybell has not hired you as his attorney. He has not accepted your services. And so for that reason to say then, oh, as a back, as a fallback, please don't hold me to any of my responsibility as a return as an attorney. Only hold me out as a citizen that doesn't know any better, essentially is disingenuous and further dishonesty to the court to say that that is semantics. Woo, he is bold. It's absolutely not. A bar licensed attorney filing something with their bar number to the court is completely different than a citizen. That is not semantics. This is what brings you within the auspices of Rule 11. I understand. I said perhaps I should have signed it as a citizen, but I didn't. All right. But then as a citizen, what could you possibly do? in the case and why would you want to delay it because as a citizen you would literally have no role whatsoever in your intent to intervene whether it's as a citizen or an attorney let me read you a couple of case quotes quote the idaho rules of criminal procedure do not provide a process for intervention the inability of non-parties to intervene in a criminal case recognizes that the considerations underlying intervention in civil cases are not applicable to criminal proceedings. That's People versus Ham, and that's State versus Johnson, 167 Idaho 454. And we've also got another Idaho case citing, quote, petitioners are correct that Idaho's rules of criminal procedure do not provide a specific mechanism for third parties to intervene in a criminal case. So again, I think there's settled case law that prohibits intervention in a criminal case. So you're not supposed to file a motion for an improper pur purpose under Idaho Rule 11. And the case law says that filing to intervene in a criminal case is improper. It is not a recognized mechanism. And so the motion by its own very nature, this motion to intervene, is improper. It's it's like saying like I am committing an ethical violation. Like that's what the caption should have been basically. He should have basically said I am committing an ethical violation. <laughs> that's how much this motion he filed is worth. And I'd like to know what authority you have that says you have a right to intervene either as an attorney or a citizen in this case. As outlined in our brief, Judge, sorry about that. As outlined in our brief, we have given the court several cases where the Idaho appellate courts have allowed people to intervene in cases in a criminal matter, even though they're not parties. That's my basis. So you intervene, and then uh, we've got two parties here. We've got the state, we've got Chad Daybell, and you're going to... He's saying that there are cases that support his position that he would be able to intervene in a criminal case that he has cited in his motions. Float around and be what if you intervene in this case? What are you going to be? I'm not going to be floating around this case, Judge, because you haven't granted my motion. Well, assuming you got to intervene, you assumed in your motion you did intervene because you called yourself the intervener once you got going in your motion. What were you going to be at that point? I was hoping to have a hearing in front of you before the trial started. Okay. To do what? A hearing to do what? What do you want to do in the case? Okay. Prior is not death penalty qualified. What do you want to do in the case as a result of that? And you said you were going to be the lawyer for the defendant or already were the lawyer for the defendant. Is not. I explained to you just a few minutes ago that that was a mistake. A mistake that was committed three times. Explain to me all of the misspellings and typographical errors in your late night filing. I was nervous and it was late at night. I didn't take this lightly. N no, no comment. You didn't take it lightly, but you used the wrong form. You misrepresented if you were an attorney or a citizen and you signed three times as attorney for defendant. Um, and that's your explanation? Yes. All right. Yeah, he would have been better off saying nothing. None of these explanations make anything any better. Mr. Ratliff, I find based on your responses, you have violated Idaho's rule 11 under the rules of civil procedure, which I find are incorporated through Idaho criminal rule 47 and 49. 
the court would note that in the rules under C1, not it's uh, mandatory. It says the court must impose an appropriate sanction on an attorney, law firm, or party that violated the rule. And similar to what would happen in a civil case with a frivolous type filing, which this was, this cost time, this cost effort, this cost real loss for the attorneys, for the court. I'm going to instruct counsel for both the state and the defense if they could itemize the time they have spent both in today's hearing, in preparing for the hearing, as well as in dealing with this pleading from the time it was filed on Friday night, the 29th, whatever time you put into that, I'm gonna direct Mr. Ratliff that you pay reasonable attorney fees incurred for the time Mr. Pryor spent at his typical hourly rate for the state's attorneys and whatever rate they are entitled to charge as public prosecutors. And the court will likewise itemize some billing time incurred in this and the sanction the court's going to order is the payment of those attorney fees the court will provide time for counsel to submit those i'll review those for reasonableness before i make an order and pursuant to the rule which requires a written order under rule c6 of rule 11 the court will describe in that order the conduct and the basis for the sanction and you're going to pay for those fees. Do you understand that, Mr. Ratliff? That's fine, Judge. Very well. That'll Your, your Honor, if I may, um, I'm going to request findings of facts and conclusions of law. As this court is aware, we submitted briefing that addressed many of the issues you addressed to Mr. Ratliff in, 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 great, in great detail, giving multiple basis for his right to intervene. The judge, you have not addressed those arguments, and so I'm going to ask for findings of fact and conclusions of law. Well, Mr. Bartliff, you can ask. I'm not inclined to do that because, again, I've got a lawyer in front of me that submitted a pleading, and the lawyer is responsible for the pleading. Uh, I'm not necessarily uh, allowing any further input on behalf of counsel for the lawyer that filed the pleading. Uh, I don't think it's proper because I'm not uh, imposing any kind of jail time or sanction similar to Rule 75 of the civil rules, which would implicate on a contempt proceeding the right to counsel. So uh, I'm going to stand by my ruling that I made and ask the attorneys to submit those. That concludes the matter for this judge, afternoon. Judge, if I may. I'm you may, judge, I am you may not. I'm done. Oh, you want to stop. So essentially, the attorney for Mr. Ratliff is like, oh, well, you didn't deal with the merits of his motion and why he thought he should be able to intervene in the case law that says he can intervene. And the judge is just like, and I'm not gonna because he's a lawyer and he knows better than to file things that are untrue and for improper purposes. And what was the improper purpose that he stated out of his own mouth? He wanted to delay the trial, which is completely improper. And so his attorney needs to fall back. Let's see what judge says. Includes the matter for this judge, afternoon. Judge, if I may. I'm you may, judge, I am you not. may not. I'm done. I'm done with this issue and I'm done wasting time on this issue in the middle of a capital case. We're done. We're in recess, period. Ooh, we're done. We're in recess. We're done. We're in recess, period. Okay, period, poo. He said he's done with you. Okay, he's had enough. Okay, he shouldn't have even had to entertain this motion at all. It's a completely ridiculous motion. I cannot state that enough. If you are concerned about an attorney's performance in a case, there are ways to address it. Write the court, seek out bar counsel, file a complaint. You do not file a motion into the case as though you are the attorney for that purpose with the sole purpose of trying to delay the trial. It's very bizarre that he did this. This is not something that attorneys would normally do. And so the judge's ire is completely appropriate. I would like to know what you think in the comment section down below. Make sure that you like the video and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye.